Christine, welcome to Book Talk. Today we're discussing Throne of Glass by Miss Sarah J. Mass. Throne of Glass is actually the first in a series of five to six books. I'm so excited. I was really nervous that this was just going to be a trilogy and there's so much groundwork laid and I just, and three books wasn't going to be enough. And when I saw that she wants to write six books to tell her whole story, uh, uh. oh, I didn't even tell you it was awesome yet. It's Bent. I loved this book. I love the characters. I love where it's going. It's just the perfect balance of the regular world kind of and fantasy elements and they're beautifully blended together. The main character is so cool. If you don't know, her name is Selena and she's an assassin. She's the world's most notorious assassin. Her parents said when she was young, the king of the assassins took her in and trained her to be his protege basically. And so she became this great assassin and then one day she was caught and then she was sent to a death camp called Endovia. And she's in this death camp and she's been there for a whole year. Now she's 18, she was 17 when she got caught. And the king has decided that he needs an assassin, a personal assassin. And instead of just hiring someone, he's like, I'm gonna have this contest. It's gonna be great. I'm gonna let everyone pick a contestant to represent them. And then that way they can all bet on who's gonna win the tests and who's gonna get to the end. It's this big test over like a long period of time. They have a million tests, there's 23 contestants, and the prince, the king's son, decides that he wants Selena, the world's most notorious assassin, to be his contestant. She gets taken to the castle, because obviously she's gonna take this deal. She's not gonna just like sit in a death camp. And it's her journey, and it's the tests, and it has this really great Harry Potter in the Goblet of Fire type feel. Like, it's weird, because it's not like Harry Potter in the Goblet of Fire, but I got that feel, that really exciting, oh, what's the next task gonna be sort of thing. You remember, you remember, and if you don't, then read Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. What are you doing with your life? But it's this great blend of kind of rain, you know, the show Rain on the CW, which I love. You should watch that if you have not watched it yet. With a twinge of Game of Thrones, and then some Graceling thrown in, and a sprinkle of Harry Potter. I just love it. I'm so excited to keep reading. I've got Crown of Midnight ready to go. We're ready to rock. I guess that's all you have to know for the non-spoilery section. There's a great love triangle building in this book too. That's not a spoiler, because the back says, two men love her, the whole land fears her, only she can save them all. It's funny, because this kind of was a spoiler. I think I would have rather gone into it without reading this one line on the back, two men love her. Because as soon as you open it, you're like, oh god, these two men are gonna love her. That's it for the non-spoilery section. I really think you should pick this up and read it and come back so we can discuss it. This is gonna be a really great series. Like, I see you going epic places. If you don't have it, I just got a book depository link, and I'll put that in the doobly-doo and you can click it and get it there. Bye, non-spoilers! Bye! Okay, so I just marathon drained like two months ago or something and I started this book and immediately, I don't know if it's because the outfits, but it's also the setting, just they started to meld together in my mind. Not the stories, but just the setting. And Dorian in my mind has turned into Francis and I can't undo it. Francis has blonde hair and Dorian has this dark hair, but not anymore. Dorian is blonde. And then there's Kale. He doesn't look like Bash to me, but the relationships that are forming in this triangle are so similar to the relationships that are in Rain. And I love the triangle in Rain. So I'm, I'm just, I'm loving this. Oh, let's talk about Andolin, Andolan, the king of assassins. Little by little we learn more about him as we read this book. And at first you're like, oh wow, what a kind man. You know, he took in this eight year old girl whose parents had died. And now I'm suspicious, like, did he kill the parents in the first place? Was he hired to assassinate them? And she was just there and he was like, oh, look at that, a free assassin that I can take in train and then make her pay me back when she gets older. I can't believe he did that, first of all. Second, then there was the thing, I know it's for her, own good, like to be a better assassin, but to make her not afraid of heights, he just like stuck her on a roof for ages at a time and just made her stand up there. Um, she wasn't good with her left hand, so let's break your right hand. Oh, I'll give you a choice. Uh, I'll break it or you can break it yourself. One way or another, that hand's getting broken. She has a huge scar where she broke her hand apart. I just, I mean, yeah, wow, you're ambidextrous now. That's cool, but really? You did that to a child? Oh God. And like, I'm glad, I'm glad he did it, I guess. But it's just really 
cruel. It seems like he's a really harsh guy. And I, I'm, I would bet that we will encounter him in this series. I don't know when. It'll probably take a little bit because, well, no, she's going to be sent out in the next book, I guess, to do errands. Not errands. Jobs. Not jobs. I mean, to kill people. So maybe she'll encounter him then or pay him a visit. I'm not a fan of him right now. I'll see what I think when we meet him. I'm really curious about her parents' backstory. I know there are three novellas that go along with this, but it sounds like novellas that happened during her training, not novellas that go all the way back to when she was actually with her parents. I'm curious more about her and Sam. I guess Sam was another assassin that was trained by the King of Assassins. I'm glad he's dead. I'm not gonna say, you know, I wish we got to know Sam and that he was still alive. I'm afraid that he will still be alive somehow. Did we find out how he died? No. Should we just know that he died? Selena has Sam, and then we got Dorian, and he has that Rosamund who left him to go marry another husband, just like Olivia in Rain. I was just like, this is Rain, except different, but I love it. Dorian has a lot of the same kind of character traits that Francis has. Like, he comes off kind of arrogant and kind of slutty, but in reality, you know, he's just kind of lost. He just doesn't know how to stand up to his dad. I just, I really love Dorian. If you can't tell right now I'm team Dorian and this love triangle situation, don't get me wrong. I don't not like Kale. Just like I don't not like Bash in Rain. I like him. I think he's cool. To me, he seems a little more serious. I know we don't get to know him as much as we get to know Dorian in this book. Dorian's a lot more open, he's funny, he teases her, they make jokes, they're so cute! He got her a puppy! Oh my god, I love when he got her the puppy! Oh, I love the ball! And then like when they go back and kiss and then the next morning, he's like, I'm sorry if it was too aggressive. She's like, no, it was fine. I mean, it was, I did not, uh, it, uh, awkward. It, <laughs> Kale, on the other hand, is always there kind of as a supportive trainer type of dude and he's very professional, you know, so we don't see that much of his personality personality. Like, they kind of nudge each other and laugh sometimes, but we, he never talks that much about himself, even though he talks about how she doesn't talk that much about herself, but it's like, you're not sharing either, bud. I love how the prince and her play pool and like, I love when he gave her the books, you know, and like, these are books that I recently read, so you have to read them and then we can talk about them. I love when and our characters love to read. We have Knox, and I liked Knox. I didn't want her really training Knox. I know that it was good that she had like an ally in the assassins, but every time she trained him, I was like, stop training him. Like, I don't want him to get any better. You need to beat him. It was really amusing to me how much her arrogance kind of stifled her in the beginning of the book. She's like, you want me to hold back? I should just stay in the middle of the Like, it didn't even occur to her that she shouldn't be awesome because it's gonna draw us too much attention to herself. Then we have Princess <laughs> Nahima of Elwi. Her name's Nahima to me. Oh my god, and then we have Hulin. <laughs> oh my god, Dorian's brother Hulin. He's Joffrey. If you watch Game of Thrones, he is Joffrey in my mind. They described him as Joffrey. He is Joffrey. I don't want him coming back to the castle ever. And I bet he's gonna wreak some nasty ass havoc in the next few books if he comes home. Thank god, like, there was an avalanche up there and he couldn't get home until spring. Like, they talk about him. Like, he's Joffrey. So I'm scared. I'm scared of Hulin. Back to Nahima, though. I knew Nahima was hiding something, like, from that very first time that she's like, oh, I don't know anything about wide marks. Wide marks? Wide, wide marks? Is that- I say wide marks, so deal with it. I knew she was lying then, but I didn't know that she was, like, a magician. <laughs> I really like how she and Selena were able to bond, and Selena was able to have this female friend that she could confide in and talk to. So we had all these murders going on. I did not- really think about Cain because he was just like the obvious choice in the beginning of the book. I didn't think about him until she read that one line in one of those winding books. It said that they consume the strength of the victim that they kill and then I was like, oh okay, it's definitely Cain the second that that happened and she was still so focused on Nahima that she wasn't able to see it. Then we have Catelyn, Caitlyn, Cat. her name's like Caltain, but I'm like, okay, I'm gonna call you Caitlyn. Caitlyn, I picture basically as Olivia from Rain. Um, she's blonde hair, you know, she's pretty, she wants the prince, but she can't have him. She always gets these headaches and she has to take opium all the time. And I was wondering the whole first half of the book, like, are these headaches because you have an opium addiction or do you have like a brain tumor? I was just, is she ill or is the opium habit creating the illness? Like, is she just need the drug all the time? But then there's a reference to him turning his ring and then her getting a strong pulse in her head and I was like, 
Oh, yeah. What's going on here? Like, Duke Parrington is doing Maddie. Yeah, that's why I'm getting this Game of Thrones vibe. First, there's Hulin, who's Joffrey. But then there's also the absence of magic. And in Game of Thrones, it's kind of like, they magic just disappeared. But in Throne of Glass, magic has been outlawed, and all the books have been burned, and there was this great kind of genocide of everything magic that King Ardalyn instigated. And King Arlen, he's gotta go. Like, that man, you you see at the end that he's not stupid, you know? He knows what's up. He knows all about magic. He uses it himself. Like, no one else is allowed to except me. It just really seems like he's on this quest for world domination. I really love all the task scenes in this book. I loved the scene when they were climbing the wall, and I loved hearing how everyone picked, like, the obvious tools. Meanwhile, Selena picked Tar to help her up the wall, which is just... So smart. Nox slipped and she had to go save him and she was about to get first. But she comes in 18th place. Kale and her have some cute banter about her coming in 18th place. And then, of course, she brings up Andolin, the king of assassins, and how he was like, well, Andolin, so he said, second place is just a fancy name for the first loser. I just, what an asshole this guy was. He was so cruel to children. A way to like tear down their dreams. I just, I really love the intricacy of this story and I love how we switch POVs a lot. And we have this whole Queen Elena deal. Queen Elena was the first queen of Ardalan and she was part fairy or part fae. And apparently, Selena is descended from her. Blood ties can't be broken. Now, going along with Queen Elena, we have this love triangle, right? And we have Kale and Dorian. You automatically, it's like second nature for you to try to figure out which one the author has meant to be endgame. Like I said, I like Kale, but I like Dorian better, and I really think Dorian is endgame here, and I'm really excited about that. And it's not just because I like Dorian better, obviously I do, and it's not just because Dorian was first, because it's not always the guy that they meet first, it is a lot of the time. But she met both of them at the same time, but she kind of was with Dorian first, because they kind of had their little relationship in this book. There's this whole overlying mantra that Selena is needed to save everyone because she understands the people and the king needs a champion that understands the people because they need to be saved right how can you save how can that ha you have to be queen queen and that's what queen elena was getting at like you could do so much right now selena is kind of stuck in this self it's not selfish because she's never really had her own freedom but when you compare you know being queen and saving everyone or leaving to do your own thing to be free that's the selfish route here she's gonna be in love with kale and she's gonna be in love with dorian but with dorian she can be this warrior queen who saves the people. They're gonna overthrow this evil bastard king and they're gonna fix things together. I think that is where this is going. It's gonna take those four years, just like Queen Elena said. You know, you have four years to realize this and she's gonna realize it. It's gonna happen. Another reason I think that this is gonna happen is that this originally was inspired by Cinderella. Like, it was originally inspired to be a retelling of Cinderella. It really went off and became its own thing, but Selena, Cinderella. What does Cinderella do? She marries the prince. I love the part in this book where they have the task where they're all partnered off and they have to duel in that white chalk circle and she's paired up against Varen and she walks in there. She doesn't even take out her sword and Varen's standing there like with his sword like ha ha and she's like Pff and then kicks him and then knocks him right out of the ring. Here's a lesson for you weapons master. Give me real men to fight, then maybe I'll bother trying. I love when Dorian gives her the candy and her teeth turn red. The Yule Miss Ball scene, that scene when she came into the ballroom just really reminded me of Ever After. You guys, with Drew Barrymore when she came in with that dress, I just, it was like that scene, except with Selena. I don't know why Kale didn't dance with her. They just kind of stood until Dorian came and was like, let's dance. I guess he didn't want to draw attention. Kale's very, you know, professional, like we said. He kind of reminds me of Four a lot um, from Divergent. And at the end of this book, Selena breaks things off with Dorian. And you could argue that, like, she doesn't like Dorian as much as he likes her, blah, blah, blah. But Selena doesn't really let herself get attacked. We see her consciously being like, no, 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 I don't like him. And, like, she's so busy with all this assassination and murder and these tests. Like, she doesn't allow 
herself to make attachments and she knows she wants to leave and be free after four years so she doesn't want to make those kinds of attachments she's scared really because she does see what the queen is saying she's a smart girl she, there's no way she can't really see where the queen is going with her whole spiel about you know you can do so much for the people you understand the people like you can change everything you know she she has to see that she means like you could be queen of our land and fix the world. She's worried about where the relationship with Dorian will go if she lets it get deeper. If she lets herself fall in love and she doesn't want that. She wants to leave. And it's gonna be interesting how her dynamic with Kale now changes. Because Kale feels safer. He's just the captain and the guard. Like, whatever. She's afraid of the inevitable end game with Dorian. Hence the dream with the blonde girl with no face with the crown that she can't handle. She doesn't want to handle it. She doesn't think she can handle it, but she can. So the mark on Selena's head, is that like some fairy power mark or something it's a wid mark but did the fairies like invent wid marks do you think like it stems from them i feel like the fae kind of own the magic or something i don't know i love that the queen was a warrior as well and i hate that they've rewritten history but it makes sense now because the story that they told was kind of weird that she stood on the side with her necklace and distracted them like she fought side by side with gavin the first king and i just love that and i love the parallel of how selena as queen would do the same thing. She's a warrior. There's this whole thing with Francis. His dad said he can make a great king maybe, but he has to be sent out to fight first. And I think maybe he'll be sent away for a little bit. And then this will give Kale and Selena more time to develop a more romantic-ish type of relationship. And then Dorian's gonna be out fighting on the war front or wherever the hell he is. He's gonna see how bad it is out there. He's gonna realize how terrible of a king his father is. And he's gonna get a little messed up. He's gonna come back and things are gonna be a little weird between him and Selena, but then they're gonna connect on a deeper level because now he understands her more than he did before. And then their relationship will be stronger than ever and they'll get married and she and Dorian are gonna fix the world together. Yeah, you think? But it's gonna be awesome. I'm so excited to keep reading this series and see where it goes. Oh, I didn't talk about the fight with Kane. The final duel with Kane was like the most stressful thing to read. It went on for so long. She was so down, you know, and she really deserved that win by the end. And it's really interesting how the fairies, I guess, originally came into their world through those Widmark gateways, Widmark portals. It's gonna be interesting to see how that comes into play. If Selena will learn to wield magic more and if she'll be opening portals, because she was kind of curious as to if she could go back and forth between the worlds. And I wonder if she's thinking like, can I visit my parents? Is mommy and daddy back there? I, I don't want you going through that portal, Selena. I don't think that's a good idea. I think that's a shitty idea. But that fight, man. What team are you on? I feel like everyone's on Team Kale now that I know that Reagan's on Team Kale. I'm like, is that, did, uh, now, I haven't read Crown of Midnight, so I don't know. I think my favorite part, I don't know, I love the ball, and I love Candy Morning, and Dorian parts, and Dorian, and with her playing billiards, oh, and when Dorian comes in, and she's playing piano, all the Dorian parts, I love those and parts. And the part where she kicked Baron's ass, just there's so many good parts, I can't pick one favorite. I wasn't even upset at the end when she broke it off with Dorian, I was like, you'll be back. You'll be back. Share your thoughts. I'm Christine. I'll talk to you next time. Bye. Hello. That's not good. That was bad. See, I feel more like a warrior princess now, but I look weird. Hello. I don't like this. What is it? My outfit? Is it my outfit? Is this weird? Is this a weird outfit? Stripping! Ah, oh, I don't like this either. What should I wear? Is this working for you? I look like Elvis or something. Yeah, I know I'm on an island, don't.